did the uh, absolute value and splitting it up into the positive and negative parts. So now we're going to actually compute these two antiderivatives. Now the easy part is computing the antiderivatives. So we got 160 minus 32t. So you're doing a t antiderivative, not an x antiderivative. So you have to just pay attention to that. Almost every problem you do is going to be an x derivative or antiderivative maybe 10% of the time it will be something different and it usually is going to be t is the second most common variable. Uh, occasionally it might be a dy but that's even more rare than dt. So antiderivative 160 I'm going to take a guess and say 160t and if I check derivative is 160 32 minus 32t we can try minus 32t squared, but when I take a derivative, I get negative 64t. So that's not going to work. I can either divide by 2 or just write 16 right there. Now once you get your antiderivative, you're going from 0 to 5, so we do that vertical bar notation which keeps track of our endpoints. Now second one, minus this exact same antiderivative, except we're going from 5 to 8. The last thing we're doing is plugging the endpoints and the fundamental theorem somewhere up here. Here we go. We're basically doing this right here. So we have what's on the right side and now we're just going to plug in the second endpoint minus the first endpoint. So I'm plugging in 5 first. And actually, let's make these numbers less ugly. I'm going to put the 16. So what algebra can I do before I plug in values? Factor. So let's go ahead and do that. I can factor out not just t, but 16t. So let's go ahead and factor out 16t. And we're left with 10 minus t. That looks a lot nicer. Minus 16t. We're left with 10 minus t again. So we got 16 times 5 multiplied by 10 minus 5 minus, and I'm going to put this in a square bracket so I can keep my first term separated from my second term. Now I'm subtracting when I plug in 0. So I could stop right here, but I'll just go ahead and write the rest of this out. So that's just the first term. Now the second term right here, plugging in 8. Minus. And whatever this turns into. So 16 times 0 is 0, so that's whole term is disappearing and we got 16 times 5 squared minus so we got 10 minus 8 is 2 times 8 is 16 so that's 16 squared plus so we got minus a negative and this is also 16 times 5 squared So we could factor out a 16 here, and we got 5 squared minus 16 plus 5 squared. So 50 minus 16, 34 maybe. Whatever that number is, good enough. I'm not multiplying that out. 
So that is how much, let's see, this object traveled in eight seconds. Yes, yes, absolutely. So that's our, wherever that went, right here. Okay. So it's always going to be, generally B is going to be bigger than A, but that's not necessarily true, because you can swap them and it becomes negative. Uh, but it's always going to be top minus bottom. So that was total distance traveled. So total is the magic word that you're basically finding absolute value. You want to count everything as positive. So we're going to do one more total problem. And this time we're going to look for total area between the function and the x-axis. So the magic word here, is, well, aside from total, we also find in the area, but if it was just area, I would integrate f from uh, a to b. But because it's total, I'm going to integrate the absolute value of f. The way we're going to treat this absolute value, same way we did before, it's a step function. It's either positive f when it's positive, or if it's going to be less than 0, you're going to use the negative f function. So we'll take a function. So our example, we'll go with x squared minus 4. Definitely some x values that make this negative. And so let's go 0 to 4. So find total area. x in the interval 0 to 4. So it makes sense to start out with the graph. So definitely when x is 0, this function is negative. So there's going to be places where it's going to be negative. So let's figure out, uh, I need to write down absolute value f of x. So it's a step function. It's either regular x squared minus 4 or negative x squared minus 4. So take one minute and figure out what x values make this positive, what x values make it negative. The easiest way to do it is figure out what makes it 0, and then figure out positive or negative in between. And you know it's a happy parabola. So it's going to look like that. You just have to figure out where is it 0. If you don't see that it's a happy parabola, you can plug in values in between. You don't have to know what the graph looks like. You just have to figure out when is it 0. So with the blue marker, I just plugged in some values in between. If you didn't see that it was a parabola, or maybe it was a degree 3, 
tree or some weird square root function that you weren't sure how to graph, just plug in values. That's also very, very quick. If you did really well in pre-calculus one, you know about bouncing and crossing x-intercepts, so you can also use that knowledge. So I know both these are crossing because I looked at the way it factored, and they're both degree one, so they're both going to cross the x-axis. So you have lots of tools to figure out positive or negative. So now we're going to write up here when, so it's positive between negative two and positive two. And negative when, now there's two intervals here, negative infinity, negative two. And positive two to positive infinity. So any questions about turning this into a step function? Now I did <coughs> make one choice, which is uh, where, when x is 2 or negative 2, this function is 0. So should I use step 1 or step 2? Well, the answer is they both give you 0. So it doesn't matter. When x equals 2, it doesn't matter if I use step 1 or step 2. So I just made a choice. I usually, uh, when it's zero, I just go with the positive version, generally. But that doesn't really matter. So what I'm talking about, if I, let's use a green marker, I could go open here and closed on these guys. So that would be also correct. Because when it's zero, you can go with either step. So I just generally default to when it is zero, just go with the first part. All right, total area, we know how to set that up. I just wrote uh, that above. So it's integral, r function, x squared minus four. We're absolute valuing this, dx, and we're only going zero to four. So if you're a number line person, we're going 0 to 4. So this is basically where we're going on the number line. So we got one part's going to be negative and another part's going to be positive. So we have to cut this up at 2. So we're going to go 0, 2, 2 to 4. So right there, I just used the rule where I can pick any number and split up into two different areas. And of course, we chose 2 so that the absolute value looks nice. 0 to 2 is where it's negative. So I make it positive. And 2 to 4, it's already positive. So it's just x squared minus 4. You can do these in one step. You don't have to show the in, uh, intermediate step that I wrote down. So any questions on these steps right here? I basically separated my calculus and my algebra out. So we're going to anti-differentiate. So let's guess and check. x squared antiderivative is definitely going to have an x cubed. And then check with the derivative, you're going to get 3x squared. So 3 times more than I want. There is an anti-power rule, which is add 1 to the power, divide by that number. But guess and check works just as well, without another rule to remember. So minus 4x from 0 to 2 plus same antiderivative going to to 4. And I should have a vertical bar here. Now a lot of times when you plug in 0 you're going to get 0, but not always. 
So I would just make sure that you actually get 0 when you plug it in. Don't just assume it's always going to be 0. That is true if you have a polynomial antiderivative, but if you have sine cosine, uh, you know, cosine of 0 is not 0. So don't just assume when you plug in 0, everything will be 0. So we get 2 cubed over 3 minus 4 times 2 minus 0 minus 0 plus 4 cubed over 3 minus 4 times 4 minus, plugging in 2, 2 cubed over 3 minus 4 times 2. I'm going to switch the square brackets on the second one. eight thirds plus four cubed minus sixteen plus eight is minus eight minus eight thirds so eight minus eight cancels everything is a third so we'll factor that out we got minus 8 plus 4 cubed minus 8, whatever that number is. So 64 minus 16, 48 maybe. So one little clue is these eights better not cancel out. Those eights should be the same number uh, when you're doing this absolute value. If they cancel out, you probably did your absolute value wrong. So you said the eights shouldn't cancel out? Correct. So if I Oh, well, not on, let's see. So here, uh-oh. Ah, the, if, so the eights I actually circled didn't cancel out, or did they? Let's see, where did they go? This guy and this guy didn't cancel. They did cancel, but it wasn't their fault. It was the fault of that term. So, okay, okay, yeah, don't worry about that. It's okay. <laughs> I'll circle it up here. So here, so okay, two, two's the value that when you plug it in shouldn't sort of cancel out with itself. Mm -hmm. And tracking where that goes, that's this. I think I circled the wrong term, and that those two terms should not cancel out. They should actually, you'll get the exact same number. So there'll be two of them instead of them canceling out. Okay. But that's, you don't, if you're just careful, they'll, they sh should be the exact same term twice. Um, I canceled it in a slightly different way. Yeah. 
So just the, I'll, I'll leave those other twos circled. So those twos should lead to terms that are exactly the same. And if those, the terms that those lead to end up canceling, you probably messed up on one of the two absolute values. You most likely made a sign error, basically. So the trickiest I could ever make this problem is have a few different times it crosses the x-axis. So if your function looks something like this, and I asked you for the area here, we'll go from A to B. You're going to have to find uh, x1, x2, x3, and figure out splitting it up and figuring out, ah, we're positive, negative, positive, negative. So then you have to go and split it up and decide which one's positive, which one's negative. So there is only one antiderivative or one integral trick that you're going to learn this quarter. Half of Calculus 2 is learning a lot more antiderivative tricks. But there's only one we're going to learn this quarter. And it turns out to be probably, it's definitely the easiest one, and it's also generally one of the most useful. Um, it kind of goes back kind of bit on the problem. So when you used uh, to find a zero, mm -hmm. Why do you use negative 2 and 2 and negative so can be negative 2 and 2 and 2 and 2 and 2 and 2 like, why, why the, like, do you pick out one or just a special one you pick out? So is your question of why did I use those two numbers? Yeah, like. So I needed to. And zero, I get that and everything. Solve that. Yeah. And there's only two solutions. It turns out they're 2 and negative 2. Yeah. There's other ways to solve it. I just chose factoring, but I could have just. So added four to both sides and square rooted. But like for the negative infinity to negative two, so then like two to infinity, like did you use, like did you use those at all? So I included a lot more x values than I needed. Okay. So I wrote the full, I only really cared about zero to four on this problem, yeah. but if I asked about negative 30 to positive 30, I would need a lot wider interval. Okay. That's why you use the. So you'd use the one on the top. Like this didn't come into play whatsoever. Okay. Because okay. only because of the interval that I was using. Okay. I just I just defined the absolute value function for all real numbers instead of just zero to four. Okay. So you use negative two because it's. Okay. Yeah, so I didn't choose negative two is not a choice I made. Oh, I don't want to, but. Uh, two and negative two are not, those aren't choices I made. Those are dictated by the function. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out negative two is not relevant in this problem because I just stopped at zero. I didn't actually go all the way to negative two. Okay. Um, so I wrote down how to define the function in the entire real line, although I didn't really need to. But if I had a different interval, I wouldn't have to do any other work. Like this is all set up for any interval on the real number line. So would you have the choice of choosing x squared minus four? Or like is there a difference between those two then? Well, it's whatever function you're given. Okay. So you were given this x squared minus four. Yeah. So you just had to find out when is it negative, when is it positive. This is called U substitution, or I think the official title is substitution method. So let's start out with something we know. What is the derivative of f of g of x? Or what rule do I need to use here? Don't say product. Chain rule. So this is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So that's what the chain rule looks like right there, written out in function notation. What I'm going to do is let 
u equal g of x and du over dx, the x derivative is g prime of x. So I'm going to do something a little weird. I'm going to solve for du. And I'm going to treat du dx like it's a fraction. So the reason we use this fraction type notation is because you can actually do algebra on the differential operator and separate it out if you need to. So let's go ahead and integrate So I'm going to re before I integrate I'm going to rewrite what is here And if you don't think mathematicians have a sense of humor, they did pick letters intentionally. So take u and f it. And so what is f of u du? So what I'm going to do is use all these letters and unwind this. So I'm going to take basically take out u and drop in f of, uh, g of x, and take out du and drop in the g prime x dx right there. So I'm going to take out the u and the du and drop in the g and g prime stuff. So we're going to do this slowly. We'll go du first. du is g prime x dx. So that's the du part. Now, what is f of u? That is f of g of x. So u is g of x. So it's f of g of x. So this is how u substitution works. So this seems a little strange. We're going to do some examples that hopefully will make this much more clear. So what you're going to do you're going to let u equal g of x and then find du, which is going to be g prime x dx. So you also need to include that part as well. All right, so our examples. You could find the antiderivative of this without knowing u substitution. Remember, you can always do algebra before or after you do calculus. So if I do algebra first, what algebra could I do to turn this into a form I could find the antiderivative? So we could take this thing to the fifth power, multiply it out, get a huge polynomial. Multiply it by 3x squared plus 1, get an even bigger polynomial. It'll have degree 17, it looks like. It'll be a really nasty polynomial. And you can just find the antiderivative. The worst part will be expanding it out. Antiderivative of a polynomial is not too bad. You just add one to the power, divide by that number. I don't want to multiply this by itself five times uh, or, and then multiply across this other term. So what we're going to do is use substitution. So the way you do u substitution, you're always starting out let u equal. Now we have to pick u. So you want to pick a u so that you see du somewhere else. So what if I let u equal 3x squared plus 1? So I want to find du dx, so take the x derivative. 
I have 6x plus 0. Do you see 6x anywhere? Anywhere else? Oh. Do you see it in the original? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. So that's not going to work. What's another choice? So what else do you see such that if I take that as u, then du will be somewhere else here? Let's try x cubed plus x. So what is du dx? This is an easy question. 2x squared. 3e. Three, 3x squared plus 1. Oh, look at that. 3x squared plus 1. So this is a very good sign right here. So the last thing, <coughs> we're going to write du. I'm going to multiply the dx over. And now we're going to go ahead and make our substitution. So there is our substitution for du. So this whole thing, 3x squared plus 1 dx, is du. And over here, I have u is x cubed plus x. So I don't just get u du, I have u to the fifth du. Are there any substitution questions? Uh, I got it. It's going to seem a little bit strange because you're substituting out not just for the function, but also the derivative part, the dx, usually times something else part. Uh, there's really one substitution, which is right here. However, that substitution has consequences. The consequence is, if I change out, uh, if I let u equal this, well then, uh, I need to go all the way into u's. I can't have x's and u's mixed together. So when you substitute, you have to go all the way. So it would not be, what you don't want to do is leave it like this. Because then you got x's here, and you got u's over here. And that's not a good mix. So once you go substitute, you have to go all the way. It's got to go all the way into u's. All right, antiderivative u to the fifth. So you need to answer in u's, not in x's. So this is a u antiderivative. All right, take a guess. U to the 6 divided by 6. So derivative will be 6 u to the 5th divided by 6, so it'll be just u to the 5th. We do have a plus c. There are no endpoints here, so you have to have that plus c. And if you leave your answer like this, I'll give you most of the points, but the problem is we didn't start out with u's. So you have to come back to x's. So we're going to unsubstitute, and we get x cubed plus x to the sixth over six plus c. So technically speaking, if you actually the whole algebra thing, you would end up with that? You would end up with a new polynomial. It would be an 18th degree polynomial, because the deriv antiderivative of a 17th degree is an 18th degree. And it would be this polynomial, well, including the divided by six part. It would be this polynomial. It would be some huge 18th degree polynomial, which would factor down to this one. So on this one, I could have avoided substitution, but there's other times where you actually can't avoid substitution. So this, the other, most of the other examples, you won't be able to actually anti-differentiate without substituting. So there are some times you can avoid it, but there are some times you cannot. Oh, that's so I took this and this are the antiderivative notation. So when I take the antiderivative, those disappear. 
It's just like, um, let's see. Like here's our derivative notation right there. Uh, if I look above, there's the original relationship, and then down below is the relationship with the derivatives. Thank you so much, Mills. I didn't know.